ancient writings describe how God once spoke to his children through prophets. Over the centuries, these writings were gathered into books we now know as scriptures. Over time, some readers of the Holy Bible came to believe that divine communication ended with the ancients. Others asked why God would stop talking when his children still needed guidance. In 1820, a 14-year-old seeker of truth, Joseph Smith, needed guidance in his life and turned to the scriptures. At the time, he lived here in a log home near the village of Palmyra, New York. Joseph said that as he studied the Bible, he discovered a vital clue. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Assured of an answer, Joseph left his home early on a spring morning and retired to the privacy of the nearby woods to pray. Somewhere near here, according to his account, he experienced a vision like those granted to ancient prophets. From what came to be known as the first vision, a visitation from God the Father and his son Jesus Christ, other heavenly manifestations followed. An angelic messenger named Moroni led Joseph to an ancient American record inscribed on gold plates and buried in a hill near Joseph's home. Joseph went to the spot and wrote an account of what he found. On the west side of the hill, not far from the top, under a stone of considerable size lay the plates, deposited in a stone box. Joseph's history relates that four years passed from the time he first saw the plates until he was able to take them from this hill and begin translating them. Because of intense persecution in Joseph's hometown of Manchester, New York, he left that area with the help of a friend and benefactor, Martin Harris, and moved to Harmony, Pennsylvania, the region where Joseph's wife, Emma Hale Smith, grew up. Here, Joseph began dictating the translation of the record, the Book of Mormon, with Martin Harris as his scribe. Martin's friends and family members back home, however, were skeptical of the project, and Martin sought some way to erase their doubts. Over a two-month period, Martin had recorded some 116 pages of text from Joseph's lips. Martin thought that seeing the manuscript might calm his family's concerns. After repeated prayers for divine sanction, Joseph reluctantly allowed Martin to take the pages from Harmony, Pennsylvania to Palmyra, New York, provided he pledged to show them only to five named family members. On June 15, 1828, not long after Martin left with the manuscript, Joseph's wife Emma gave birth to the couple's first son after a difficult labor. Complications led to the baby's death that same day and nearly took Emma's life too. The baby's tiny body was laid in this grave a short distance from the couple's home. Meanwhile, Emma hovered near death and Joseph nursed her attentively for two weeks. As Emma recovered and the couple struggled with their grief, Joseph grew increasingly worried about the manuscript. Finally, when Emma was well enough, Joseph set out for Palmyra, New York to find Martin and the 116 manuscript pages. They met at Joseph's parents' new home in Manchester. Here, Martin confessed that he had broken his pledge and someone had stolen the pages. The loss deeply distressed both men. Joseph's mother recalled that Joseph exclaimed, All is lost. Is lost. Oh, what shall I do? I have sinned. It is me that tempted the wrath of God. Joseph returned home to Harmony and in July 1828 received a revelation. The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated. Neither can they come to naught. 
But remember, God is merciful. Therefore, repent of that which thou hast done. After a period of anguish and reflection, Joseph began dictating the Book of Mormon translation again in April 1829 with the help of a new scribe, Oliver Cowdery, who had learned of the project from Joseph's family members and felt inspired to seek him out. They worked at Joseph and Emma's home in Harmony, all the while struggling to make ends meet. Many people have wondered just how the process of translation took place. During the time Joseph had the plates, several people watched him translate. They said that rather than looking at the record itself, he looked into the interpreters or another seer stone, blocking out external light such as by placing the interpreters in his hat and putting his face down into it. Joseph himself, however, refused to elaborate on a process he considered sacred. He said that it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He said simply that he translated by the gift and power of God. In less than 90 days, only about 60 of which were used in the actual translation process, the manuscript of the Book of Mormon was finished. With Martin Harris's financial backing, Joseph Smith convinced Palmyra printer Egbert Grandin to publish the new book of scripture here in his shop on Main Street in Palmyra. This is an actual page from the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon. The manuscript is a long series of words with little punctuation and few corrections, clearly a dictation. This page of the manuscript has particular interest because it begins in the handwriting of Oliver Cowdery and then reaches the point at which the handwriting changes as another scribe takes over. At that point, we see a verse that is very familiar to Latter-day Saints. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, said unto my father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he commandeth them. On this very sheet then, a scribe captured these words in English for the first time as Joseph Smith spoke them. After completing the translation, Joseph had Oliver Cowdery and others make a backup copy of the manuscript. With the loss of the 116 pages still fresh in his mind, he didn't want to lose work again. This backup copy served as the printer's manuscript and was used for typesetting the Book of Mormon in Grandin's print shop. In those days before computers and word processing software, type was set one character at a time. A 19th century print shop typically had cases of type with compartments to hold each letter. Small letters were in the lower case and capital letters in the upper case all arranged so typesetters could quickly reach the letters they used most. They pulled individual pieces of type and arranged them on a stick to match the words in a manuscript. After gathering enough lines of type, they divided them into pages, arranging them in a form for printing. When the form was filled, one printer inked the type and another rolled a large piece of paper into the press. The first one pulled a lever printing the typeset pages. For the Book of Mormon, the printers used a method that created two matching copies of 16 pages on each sheet of paper. Once both sides were printed, they used a bone knife to tear the sheet in two. It took 37 of these half sheets, folded and bound, to make one copy of the Book of Mormon. This is an original uncut half sheet of the Book of Mormon with 16 pages, eight per side. To fulfill the contract for 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon, 5,000 copies just like this one had to be printed. Grand and staff also had to print 5,000 copies of 36 other half sheets, each with 16 pages apiece except the last. That meant printing nearly 3 million total pages for the first edition of the Book of Mormon. Needless to say, the process took a long time. This is the original copyright for the Book of Mormon. To obtain it, Joseph had to fit within one of the categories of people allowed to claim copyright under the law. The term author and proprietor included translators, 
So Joseph is credited as author and proprietor on the title page of the Book of Mormon, just as he is here in the original copyright. After the pages of the Book of Mormon were typeset and printed, they moved from the third floor of Grandin's print shop to the second floor, where they were bound into books and prepared for sale in the bookstore downstairs. On March 26, 1830, Grandin himself ran a notice in his newspaper, The Wayne Sentinel. It begins the Book of Mormon and quotes the language from the title page of the book, followed by this announcement. The above work, containing about 600 pages, large duodecimo, is now for sale, wholesale and retail, at the Palmyra Bookstore by Howard and Grandin. This is an original first edition of the Book of Mormon. On the title page, we see the familiar language, The Book of Mormon, an account written by the hand of Mormon upon plates taken from the plates of Nephi. Then we see the paragraphs underneath it that are reproduced in every copy of the Book of Mormon, followed by the language, By Joseph Smith, Jr., author and proprietor. Palmyra, printed by E.B. Grandin for the author, 1830. In this first edition, Joseph Smith included a preface describing for readers the loss of the 116 manuscript pages of the Book of Mormon and how he brought forth the rest of this work. In many ways, this was Joseph Smith's first written history. This room on the second story of the Whitney store was the original meeting place for the School of the Prophets, a religious training class. It became famous as the setting for events leading to the Word of Wisdom, the health code included in the Doctrine and Covenants. Kirtland was the setting for many of Joseph Smith's revelations, but it was also the site for reprinting the Book of Mormon. In 1837, missionaries were called to cross the Atlantic and preach in the British Isles. They needed copies of the Book of Mormon to aid them in their missionary work, and the 5,000 copies of the first edition were pretty well depleted. To meet the need for more copies, Oliver Cowdery and Company printed a new edition for Parley P. Pratt and John Goodson. Notice the size difference between the first and second editions. The first edition was sized for the bookshelf, but because members of the church wanted to carry the Book of Mormon around and read it, the publishers decided to make the second edition small enough to place in a pocket. As they began planning this edition, they came up with another idea. Because the Doctrine and Covenants had been printed two years earlier, they reasoned that it would be useful to bind it in with the Book of Mormon. Well into the printing process, however, they realized that combining the books would make the volume too bulky. So they published the Book of Mormon by itself and added a notice at the end. It reads, Contrary to our expectations when the foregoing work was commenced, we've been induced to abandon the idea of attaching to it the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. We came to this conclusion from the fact that the two connected would make a volume entirely too unwieldy for the purpose intended, that of a pocket companion. When the Latter-day Saints began gathering in Nauvoo, demand for scriptures was running high. To help meet the need for published scriptures, Joseph Smith agreed to the publication of another edition of the Book of Mormon. At the time, he still had the original manuscript of the book in his possession, and he used it to help prepare the 1840 edition, the third edition, where he was able to make some corrections and revisions. Many have wondered what happened to the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon after this time, and why we have only a portion. In 1841, on the banks of the Mississippi River near Joseph Smith's home, the church was building a hotel for visitors called the Nauvoo House. As part of the project, builders laid a hollow cornerstone for holding keepsakes. After using the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon to prepare the 1840 edition, Joseph placed the manuscript in the Nauvoo House cornerstone. Here it lay for over four decades before being rediscovered and removed. By that time, most of the pages had deteriorated from moisture. 
a result of the high humidity, flooding of the Mississippi River, or the high water table along the riverbank. Only about one-fourth of the original manuscript survives to the present day. Here in archival plastic are two samples of the surviving manuscript. This one lay near the top of the cornerstone box above the water that seeped in. As you can see, it survived intact. These fragments show what happened to pages closer to the bottom of the box. Now, thanks to the Community of Christ, which owns the Nauvoo House property and the original cornerstone, you are about to witness an event that has historical significance itself. This morning, we moved the cornerstone back to where it was from 1841 to 1882. Now, for just a brief moment, we will set these manuscript pieces in the cornerstone box. That is the last place Joseph Smith saw them. The next edition of the Book of Mormon was published by members of the Church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who left on a mission to England in 1839. When they left, they took with them the 1837 second edition, because the third edition, with Joseph Smith's changes, had not yet been printed. As a result, the fourth edition of the Book of Mormon, printed in Liverpool, England in 1841, followed the text of the second edition, missing the changes of the third edition printed in 1840. Despite missing Joseph Smith's 1840 revisions, the 1841 Liverpool edition of the Book of Mormon is still remarkable. For one thing, the Liverpool copies tended to have more elegant bindings than those published in the United States. This copy is nicely printed and bound with beautiful type, gold stamping on the cover, and pages with gilt four edges. This copy was treasured by its owners who used it not only as a book of scripture, but also as an autograph album for church dignitaries who visited their home. The Book of Mormon in all its editions has hundreds of pages and numerous characters, themes, and settings, as well as a complex narrative and geography. Joseph Smith was a poor and largely unschooled farmer and laborer who dictated this book of scripture in a single draft over a period of less than 90 working days. Even as a well-funded scholar with a graduate school education, modern equipment, and a skilled support staff, I need years and multiple drafts to finish a book of comparable length. I have read the Book of Mormon dozens of times, and each time I read it, I gain new spiritual insights. I believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. As bound copies of the Book of Mormon were first being offered to the public in this bookstore, Joseph Smith went on to another scripture project. In October 1829, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery purchased a Bible similar to this one at this very store. By June 1830, Joseph had started to revise the King James text in what became known as the Joseph Smith Translation. It was not a character-for-character -character translation from Hebrew or Greek, the way scholars traditionally do it. Rather, Joseph revised, amplified, and clarified the English text, leading some later writers to call his work an inspired version. As Joseph Smith followed that approach, he dictated a revelation that became the first chapter of a work now known as the Book of Moses. It was a dramatic account of Moses' experiences on an exceedingly high mountain that has no corresponding text in the Hebrew Bible. The Pearl of Great Price is a selection of scriptural works that came through the prophet Joseph Smith. Those selections include portions of the Old Testament and New Testament from the Joseph Smith translation. A portion of the Bible translation reached Missouri, where it appeared in the Evening and the Morning Star. Titled, Extract from the Prophecy of Enoch, this revelation to Joseph would become Chapter 7 of the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price. 
Also in the 1830s, a portion of Joseph Smith's translation of the book of Matthew in the New Testament appeared as a broadside. The same segment of Joseph's translation eventually became Joseph Smith Matthew in The Pearl of Great Price. In the mid-1830s, Joseph acquired some mummies and papyrus from Egypt. He began to translate the papyrus, part of which was eventually published and became known as the Book of Abraham. Some of the papyrus and the mummies were later lost, but these are surviving papyrus fragments of what Joseph Smith acquired in 1835. Only one of these fragments, this one, is recognizable to most Latter-day Saints today. How do we know that these papyrus fragments were ones Joseph Smith owned in the 1830s? Much of the papyrus was displayed in a museum in Chicago and probably burned in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. But in 1947, unknown to the church, several papyrus fragments made their way to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City with a chain of custody that identified them as coming from Joseph Smith. Other evidence comes from the paper on which the papyri were mounted. When Joseph Smith acquired this papyrus in Kirtland in the mid-1830s, he or his associates unrolled it carefully and pasted it on scrap paper so it would stay flat. As the fragments are turned over and the scrap paper is examined, interesting clues are seen. Here, for example, is a map of northeastern Ohio where Kirtland is located. On this page is a design for a building with tiered pulpits at both ends and rows in between. At first, it appears to be a sketch of the Kirtland Temple. On closer examination, however, the drawing turns out to be the plans for the even earlier temple planned for Independence, Missouri, that was never constructed because of violent opposition to the church there. Because of the information on the scrap paper that backs the papyrus, we have further proof that these documents obtained by the church from the Metropolitan Museum in 1967 are in fact part of the original Joseph Smith papyri. Once the church's members moved to Nauvoo, Illinois, they began building a new temple. They also began publication anew. In fact, church publishing in Nauvoo was more prolific than at any other time during Joseph Smith's life. The church began to publish a newspaper called The Times and Seasons. From 1839 to 1841, the printing operation was located here, on the northeast corner of Water and Bain Streets. In 1841, it moved west across the street. Finally, in 1845, it reopened again here on the west side of Main Street in Nauvoo between Kemble and Parley Streets. It was in the pages of the Times and Seasons that the Book of Abraham first became available to the Latter-day Saints. This Book of Abraham was later to become part of the Pearl of Great Price. Joseph Smith had printing plates made of three Egyptian documents to print with the Book of Abraham, including a plate of one of the surviving papyrus fragments. These are the plates he commissioned, carved by a convert artist, Reuben Hedlock. Since two of the original documents were later lost, the plates and the prints made from them are the earliest copies that have survived to our day. Also in the pages of the Times and Seasons, Joseph Smith published a letter he had written to John Wentworth, a newspaper editor who had asked for a statement of his life and beliefs. At the end of that statement, Joseph Smith appended several belief statements known today as the Church's Articles of Faith. The first one reads, We believe in God the Eternal Father, and in His Son Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. It was also in the pages of the Times and Seasons that Joseph Smith began to run, in serial form, a history of his life. He had started dictating that history during his short tenure in Missouri. Of Joseph's many efforts to keep a history, this one proved the most enduring and was intended as a defense against accusations made by critics. The history of Joseph Smith begins, 
Owing to the many reports which have been put in circulation by evil designing persons in relation to the rise and progress of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all of which have been designed by the authors thereof to militate against its character as a church and its progress in the world, I have been induced to write this history. When the history reached the date of June 1830, it included the revelation that became known as Moses chapter 1. All of these various spiritual texts became precious to the members of the church, especially after Joseph Smith's death. Those fortunate enough to have saved copies of the church's early newspapers had access to them. Others did not. In 1851, Franklin D. Richards, a senior church leader serving in England, decided to pull these materials together in a pamphlet. This is a first edition of that pamphlet which he titled, The Pearl of Great Price, being a choice selection from the revelations, translations, and narrations of Joseph Smith, first prophet, seer, and revelator to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The name Pearl of Great Price is found in the New Testament. Now, in a single publication, church members had access to the Book of Moses from Joseph's work on the inspired version of the Bible, the Book of Abraham based on the papyrus fragments, Joseph Smith Matthew, again from the Bible translations, Joseph Smith history, Joseph's own narrative writings, and the articles of faith from Joseph's letter to John Wentworth. As the decades passed, demand for the pamphlet increased, particularly among Latter-day Saints gathered in Utah. In 1878, a second edition, published in Salt Lake City, helped make these writings more widely available. In the October 1880 General Conference of the Church, this Utah edition was accepted by the Saints as the Word of God. The Doctrine and Covenants is a collection of revelations given to leaders of the Church beginning with Joseph Smith. These revelations were first recorded by scribes on loose sheets of paper, like these shown here. Later, they were copied into an official record book. This precious manuscript, labeled on its side Book of Commandments and Revelations, is a record book of Joseph Smith's revelations received to that point in 1831. Because many of the loose sheets were later lost, this record book contains the earliest known copies of most of the revelations in it. This volume served as the printer's manuscript for Joseph Smith's first published book of revelations, which would be titled, A Book of Commandments. William Wines Phelps, a new convert and newspaper man, was called as the church's first printer. In June of 1832, he was preparing the revelations for publication at his printing shop in the frontier town of Independence, Missouri. He also began printing the church's first newspaper, The Evening and the Morning Star. He used it to preview many of the revelations that would appear in the Book of Commandments. The first article in the first issue of the church paper is titled, Revelations, the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. The Articles and Covenants were, in effect, the Church's Constitution or Administrative Handbook. They are known to Latter-day Saints today as Doctrine and Covenants, Section 20. When the Church first organized in 1830, it was called the Church of Christ, but that name created confusion with other groups that had similar names. So at a conference in Kirtland in 1834, members of the Church voted to change the name to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. That name, however, ran afoul of a Book of Mormon verse directing that the Church be named after Christ himself. Finally, by revelation to Joseph Smith in 1838, the name was formally changed to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The print shop in Independence, Missouri was located on the second story of a substantial brick building, the first story of which housed the Phelps family. Over the time the Evening and the Morning Star was published, William Phelps was able to print several of Joseph Smith's revelations in the newspaper. At the same time, he was preparing to publish the revelations in the Book of Commandments. 
Just as the Book of Mormon was printed on large sheets that were later folded and trimmed to make a book, so the complete Book of Commandments would consist of six large sheets folded and trimmed. On July 20, 1833, after five of those sheets had been printed, vigilantes opposed to the church's settlement in Missouri attacked the Phelps printing operation. They evicted the Phelps family from their home on the first floor and climbed to the second story, where they destroyed the printing operation, tossing the sheets of the Book of Commandments into the street. Finally, they demolished the two-story brick building, tearing it completely to the ground. Some of the church members were brave enough to brook the attacker's wrath and rescue some of the sheets. Stories of their bravery have been passed down, particularly one about Mary Elizabeth Rollins and her sister Caroline. My sister Caroline and myself were in a corner of a fence watching them. And when they spoke of the commandments, I was determined to have some of them. Sister said if I went to get any of them, she would go too, but said they will kill us. While their backs were turned, we went, and we got our arms full and were turning away when some of the mob saw us and called on us to stop. But we ran as fast as we could. Two of them started after us. Seeing a gap in a fence, we entered into a large cornfield, laid the papers on the ground, and hid them with our persons. The corn was from five to six feet high and very thick. They hunted around considerable and came very near us, but did not find us. The girls followed some trees to an old stable where they found William Phelps' wife, Sally, and gave the sheets to her. Those sheets, and others rescued, were later folded and trimmed to form books like this one. Because most of the printed sheets were lost, these books are quite rare. The Church History Library in Salt Lake City has the largest collection of surviving copies, the six shown here. This copy is interesting because it belonged to Edward Partridge. He was the bishop in Independence, Missouri, where the book was printed. On the day the printing operation was disrupted, he was brutally hauled to the public square, partially stripped of his clothing, and covered with hot tar and feathers. And yet, he survived to receive one of these precious copies of a Book of Commandments. At the time the print shop was destroyed, Phelps and his colleagues were apparently experimenting with the title page of the book. Like that of most surviving copies, this one has a decorative border. Here's a copy that does not have that flourish. It was acquired by Wilford Woodruff, a member of the Camp of Israel, later known as Zion's Camp, who traveled to Missouri in an effort to help restore his fellow church members to the lands from which they had been driven. He penned his name opposite the title page on the flyleaf. Like the other copy, this one shows that it was printed in Zion by W. W. Phelps and Company, 1833. But of course, neither of these is a complete book. They have pages in them from only five of the six large sheets we think were planned for the volume. In Elder Woodruff's copy, it's easy to see these large page gatherings because they still hold together. You can go through them gathering by gathering. There's one, two, three, four, and five. Since the book is incomplete, the fifth one ends in the middle of a chapter or section as it was later called. Fortunately, Wilford Woodruff had access to a manuscript of the Revelation. In his own hand, on another gathering of pages that he bound into his copy of the book, he finished writing the rest of that Revelation. He also copied in another Revelation, the new revelation begins midway down this page with the phrase, A word of wisdom for the benefit of the council of high priests. It is one of the earliest copies of the health code for which Latter-day Saints are well known today. Because the Book of Commandments printing project was disrupted, there was an immediate need once again to print the revelations of Joseph Smith. At that point, a decision was made to expand the book with new revelations that Joseph had received, including the revealed health code known as the Word of Wisdom. After the Book of Commandments and Revelations manuscript was sent from Kirtland, Ohio, down to Independence, Missouri, another record book was created in which to record Joseph Smith's revelations. 
This record book was subsequently labeled Kirtland Revelations. Today we call it the Kirtland Revelation Book, or just Revelation Book Two. It was in this book that a scribe recorded a revelation that Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon received in Hiram, Ohio on February the 16th, 1832. Today we know it as Doctrine and Covenants, Section 76. In those days, it was simply known by its title, The Vision. These two precious manuscript books, the Book of Commandments and Revelations and the Kirtland Revelation Book, became the basis for the next edition of Joseph Smith's Revelations, the title of which was changed. Joseph Smith led the committee that compiled the next edition, and they elected not only to include more revelations than in the Book of Commandments, but also to bind something else in with them. That something was a series of lectures on the subject of faith given in 1834 and 1835 during religion classes at a church school in Kirtland known as the School of the Elders. Binding these lectures together with the revelations led to a change in the volume's name. The new title was based on the book's two components. In the 1835 edition, the first section of the book was the seven lectures on the doctrine of the church. They were followed by a second part, covenants and commandments of the Lord, or what members of the church today would call revelations. The lectures on the doctrine, combined with the covenants and commandments, led Joseph Smith and his fellow committee members to rename the book Doctrine and Covenants to reflect the two components. The title page reads, Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, carefully selected from the revelations of God. The lectures on faith remained in the Doctrine and Covenants until the 1921 edition, when they were removed because they were not on par with the revelations. This copy of the Doctrine and Covenants was owned by Newell K. Whitney, an early convert to the church in Kirtland. His store, in which I'm now standing, served as an important meeting place for Joseph Smith and other church members, and was a site where Joseph Smith received several revelations included in the Doctrine and Covenants. Up the hill from the Whitney store rose the most important edifice in Kirtland, the House of the Lord, or Kirtland Temple. The temple had several close ties to the Doctrine and Covenants. An 1833 revelation called for a printing house, which was built near this spot, just west of the temple. The first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was printed in that shop in 1835. The same revelation called for the building of an house for the presidency, for the work of the presidency in obtaining revelations. That house was never constructed, but its purpose was fulfilled in the temple's third story, or attic. This is the uppermost floor, or attic, of the Kirtland Temple. A series of offices filled the attic, culminating in Joseph Smith's office on the West End. The office doubled as the office of the First Presidency of the Church, and indeed served as a place for obtaining revelations. Here, Joseph Smith wrote down the prayer for dedicating the temple, a prayer later added to the Doctrine and Covenants. Two months before the dedication, according to Joseph's history, he had a vision here of the celestial kingdom of God, a vision included today in the Doctrine and Covenants. The dedication itself took place in this room, known as the lower court of the temple. Joseph stood at the second set of pulpits from the top when he delivered the dedicatory prayer on Sunday, March 27, 1836. April 3rd, one week later, was Easter and Passover. After distributing the emblems of the Lord's Supper to the congregation, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery retired to these pulpits, the veil of the temple having been lowered. According to a nearly contemporaneous account kept by a scribe, Joseph and Oliver prayed, after which they experienced a series of visions. The account describes their seeing in succession, the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit, accepting the temple as his house, followed by Moses, Elias, and Elijah. These visions were later added to the Doctrine and Covenants. Because of increasing troubles in Ohio, Joseph Smith left the state and went to Missouri, where he hoped to find peace and establish the church's headquarters. 
He was not long in Missouri, however, before further tensions broke out, beginning in the latter part of 1838. As Latter-day Saints fought to maintain their lands, near civil war erupted between them and their neighbors. Their neighbors prevailed, and while seeking to negotiate peace, Joseph Smith was arrested and thrown into a prison with the ironic name of Liberty Jail. This jail, located where I am now seated, was described by Assistant Church Historian B.H. Roberts as a temple prison. Roberts coined that phrase because the anguish of imprisonment in a dark, cold dungeon led to some of Joseph Smith's most poignant revelations. Here, for example, is the original letter in two parts that Joseph wrote to his wife Emma and the church at large in March 1839. In his anguish he wrote, Oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? At the bottom of this page are the signatures of the prisoners, Joseph Smith Jr., Hiram Smith, Lyman White, Caleb Baldwin, and Alexander McRae. Extracts of this lengthy two-part letter were later added to the Doctrine and Covenants. Sections 121, 122, and 123 capture both the pathos of Liberty Jail and Joseph Smith's feeling of closeness to God during his months in a dungeon in this corner of Missouri. One other book of scripture was in the process of being printed during Joseph Smith's lifetime, and that was the second edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. By mid-June 1844, most pages of the second edition had been typeset and run off at the church's print shop in Nauvoo and were just waiting for binding. That was before Joseph Smith and other church leaders left the city at the request of the governor of the state and went to the nearby town of Carthage, where they were unexpectedly thrown into jail. Earlier that month, Joseph Smith and a few close associates had left Nauvoo and crossed the Mississippi River, hoping to escape their enemies. Joseph thought that if he left Nauvoo, the pressures on the Latter-day Saints there would decrease, since the church's enemies were mainly after him. But when some of his followers begged him to return to Nauvoo, accusing him of abandoning his people, he felt troubled that they would think he was leaving just to save himself. He said, If my life is of no value to my friends, it is of no value to me. Joseph returned back across the Mississippi River and in returning, knew that the move would likely cost him his life. After bidding loved ones goodbye in Nauvoo, Joseph Smith started for Carthage with his elder brother Hiram and others who were close to him. As Joseph approached Carthage, it was with a sense of his impending death. Crowds of vigilantes were massing in and near the town, hoping for a chance to get at him. Once he was there, they would not let him escape again. With Joseph and Hiram Smith in the Carthage jail on June 27, 1844, was John Taylor, a member of the church's Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who was responsible for printing this second edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. Also present was the church historian, Willard Richards. A little after 5 p.m. that day, an armed mob stormed the jail through this door, shooting and killing the Smith brothers, wounding John Taylor, and grazing Willard Richards on the ear. Willard Richards sent a message to the Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo that read, Joseph and Hiram are dead. Taylor wounded, not very bad. Perhaps the words not very bad were meant to calm John Taylor's family or the Latter-day Saints as a whole, but his wounds were, in fact, quite serious. I was struck by a ball from the door about midway up my thigh. I fell upon the windowsill and cried out, I'm shot. I crawled under the bed and was wounded in three other places. One ball entered a little below the left knee and never was extracted. Another entered the forepart of my left arm, a little above the wrist, and passing down by the joint, lodged in the fleshy part of my hand. Another ball 
struck me on the fleshy part of me left ape and tore away the flesh as large as me hand. John Taylor eventually recovered from his wounds. When he was able, he went back to his print shop in Nauvoo where he found the sheets of the Doctrine and Covenants still waiting to be bound. He decided that before binding them up into books, he would prepare a tribute to Joseph and Hiram Smith. He found some space on the last sheet that did not have any print on it. By reducing the size of the type, he managed to fit his tribute into the space that was left. This is what he wrote. When Joseph went to Carthage to deliver himself up to the pretended requirements of the law, two or three days previous to his assassination, he said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men. I shall die innocent, and it shall yet be said of me, he was murdered in cold blood. In the Doctrine and Covenants, John Taylor also described what Hiram Smith did before leaving Nauvoo for Carthage. Hiram, the elder brother, had encouraged Joseph to go to Carthage. But Hiram felt the weight of responsibility for the decision and reached for his copy of the Book of Mormon to find comfort. Turning to a scripture that had deep meaning on that occasion, he read the verse, turned down the page to mark it, and closed the volume. The book he used that day was this very 1841 Liverpool edition that the family treasured over generations and used as an autograph album. How do we know it's the very book? In the back is a statement penned by Hiram's son, Joseph F. Smith, declaring this to be the very book his father marked before going to Carthage. Turning to the back of the book, we find the turned down page, which has since been turned up to keep it from tearing. But an X marks the passage Hiram read that morning, a passage that seemed especially meaningful to him under the circumstances. In his mind, he and his brother Joseph were about to turn themselves over to non-believers, people they called Gentiles. Understanding the meaning of that word and Hiram's situation, the verse becomes a prayer, and this is how it reads. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord, that he would give unto the Gentiles grace, that they might have charity. And of course, they did not have charity. In this very room, they shot and killed Joseph and his brother Hiram, which led John Taylor to write in his tribute. Henceforward, their names will be classed among the martyrs of religion. And the reader in every nation well be reminded that the Book of Mormon and this book of Doctrine and Covenants of the Church cost the best blood of the 19th century to bring it forth for the salvation of a ruined world. The items we featured hold great interest for historians as artifacts of the past. They have tremendous monetary value to collectors willing to pay fortunes for them. But for Latter-day Saints, their greatest value is as scripture, as the Word of God, brought forth through modern prophets to help bring to pass the salvation and eternal life of the human family.